my next marvelous task is to bring you Juliet Eilperin, who has, who is a environmental and science and politics reporter at the Washington Post, where I used to work, and she's one of our, our stars. And she's also the author of Demon Fish, Travels Through the Hidden World of Sharks, which is an amazingly interesting book, especially when you start reading all the stuff about her jumping off boats into a sea full of things with big teeth. Juliet, tell me what sharks have to do with resilience. A, a lot. So basically what I found, what was interesting about writing this book is I find myself having to make the case for sharks and their continued existence. And so when, when you look at it, you can start with, you know, basically you're not going to make the warm and fuzzy argument. Uh, they're not penguins. They abandon their young. In the case of certain species, they in fact even eat their siblings in utero. So it's like you can't, you can't save them because love, they're lovable. And then you look at it and, and you know, there certainly is a rational argument you can make for the role that they play in ecosystems and people just their eyes glaze over. So I think one of the most effective and to me one of the most surprising arguments that I discovered in the course of reporting the book is the idea that their ability as killers and as the top predators in the sea actually provide engineering clues and solutions for human beings. And so essentially when I went through it and kind of tried to talk to people about what are the you know, the practical implications that you can get through this field of biomimicry, what you really see is that, you know, we can look at how they detect electrical currents and is there a way we could model car batteries on that? Could we look at their armored skin teeth and could we cover our ships with it to allow them to resist barnacles and, and move faster? And so there are all these different ways where you can essentially look at how they have already adapted to the environment. And while, again, sharks are a fantastic example, there's just, there's a team now working on a robot modeled on a jellyfish. There are people trying to make better helicopters based on how whales, uh, you know, move. And so really kind of your possibilities are endless. And so that's, that's how sharks can help, our, help us be resilient. Okay. In, in Demon Fish, you talk about a journal article called, quote, a review of a LASMO branch reproductive behavior with a case study on the nurse shark. And you say it's one of the most fascinating things you've ever read, which raises two questions. First, do you get out much? <laughs> and second, what does shark sex tell us about resilience? Well, that's really interesting. All right, so right. I mean, basically, let's be honest. It, it's shark porn. It's fascinating. You know, it's, 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 it's basically an incredibly detailed description of, of shark mating. Um, and, and particularly by uh, a couple of folks, including Jeff Carrier, uh, the lead author, because uh, nurse sharks are easier. One of the things that's really difficult about learning about sharks is how elusive they are. But nurse sharks, in many ways, are the most accessible. They're the ones when a lot of people say, you know, I went snorkeling and I saw this shark and it freaked me out and it was lying on the bottom doing nothing. That's a nurse shark. And so um, when looking at how um, sharks have, how sharks' reproduction can provide clues to resilience, I think there are a lot of different ways. But one is, frankly, just how they have so many different ways that they engage in reproduction. I mean, both, I mean, and in fact, the way that, of course, is often the most terrifying to males, I'll be honest, is that we have learned within the last few years that female sharks of multiple species can reproduce on their own. So they have really cracked that nut. And Vir virgin birth. Exactly, virgin birth. Uh, the first one was called the Jesus shark, even though it was a female. And so what they've noticed is, and this has happened because of zoos, that essentially we've kept sharks that did not reach reproductive age in captivity, and lo and behold, they can still have babies. And so I think that that would be one of the, you know, again, potentially terrifying, but also inspiring ways to look at how sharks' reproduction can show you that they are just, I mean, it's incredible how resilient they are under, you know, the worst of circumstances. So resilience involves, first we get rid of all the males? <laughs> <laughs> just means if there aren't ones around, you figure out what to do. That's all we're saying. Right. Um, in Demon Fish, you describe the island of Palmyra, Palmyra, Palmyra yes. as such a shark paradise yeah. that everything else with the slightest vulnerability is, quote, eaten within seconds, end quote. Yeah. So why are we talking about sharks and resilience? What about all those other poor fish? <laughs> it's a good point. 
Well, and they have many fascinating coping mechanisms of their own, which are also things that we explore. Um, and of course, sometimes you're looking at also is this question, and I think, you know, obviously, you know, as that video just showed, one of the things that I think people are getting a better sense of is how to kind of pull back and look at a broader lens that, you know, yes, it, you do want to look at an individual creature and how it operates and see what it means for us as individuals. But when you're really talking about resilience, a lot of what you're talking about is how on the broadest level can, you know, ecosystems, societies, cities, whatever you're using, kind of your broad networks, how do they respond to pressures and rebound? And of course, when you look at it in that broad lens, for example, sharks are very good for coral reefs, even though some little critters would rather that they didn't exist. So sharks are the cops on the beat. They're the Absolutely, ones they're the cops on the beat. And what, one thing that I love about, about sharks in this way, that, you know, that again, it's a little, I try to play up other things aside from the murder aspect of sharks, because that has its yeah. downside. And so what I love is that they operate through fear as well, the way police officers do. And so there are great examples of how you can have seagrass beds that aren't overfed by certain, certain you know, creatures because essentially they're just freaked out that the sharks might come. And so I like that. That's the benevolent, I think, uh, police you know, police, uh, policing mechanism. That and, I and wolves have done this. And wolves are one of the, you know, the greatest examples of this. And, you know, we've seen the reintroduction to Yellowstone. And, you know, what's incredible is it basically, they brought back wolves. And again, tons of people out west uh, hate wolves. But, it, you know, it brings back everything. I mean, it's incredible how it brings back the ashes and the willows. And there's just now signs being done about essentially it's bringing back rivers in a way they didn't expect because there's so many cascading effects from being freaked out by something that can eat you. So it pays for humans to have comp competitor predators. Exactly. Exactly. Even though it's a little tough to reconcile. <laughs> I hate when that happens. Yeah. Um, in Demon Fish, you talk about how, how would the ocean look if, it was invested, if we were invested in its resilience instead of plundering its depths? Right. What would that look like? And more to the point, how would you do that? How right. would you get to investing in resilience? Um, I, so a couple different things. I mean, I think that it's, a, so one, I think, you know, you'd basically have uh, an ocean that would look more similar, although of course not identical to the way it did centuries before. So essentially you would have a number of species rebounding, you'd have, a, you'd have more fish in it, you would have, uh, you know, coral reefs and kind of the hard structure, the stony structure, at the, you know, and the seafloor that would come back to some extent. So, you know, that's, and, and one of, the, I think one of the really interesting questions that in fact that raises is that we don't exactly know what the sea looked, bad, looked like, you know, before humankind, essentially. Like, you can obviously do modeling, and you can go to really remote areas like Palmyra, and you can say, oh, look, you know, this is fascinating. You actually have sharks that outnumber, you know, uh, species lower down on the pyramid, which is not something we thought about. But part of it is that we have such a skewed baseline, it's almost hard for us to imagine what that looks like. But there are a few relatively pristine places. And then in terms of how you go about doing that, essentially, you do a combination of things, but part of it is, frankly, putting some places off limits. That basically, if you're, you know, if you're really serious about this and you really actually want the oceans to be more resilient, part of what you're going to do is say that certain areas cannot be extracted the way they ha are. Part of it will be restoration, which is going on right now and going on near here in terms of restoring eelgrass beds and, you know, marshes and a whole set of different, uh, you know, replanting, doing coral nurseries, which they're doing. So part of it is doing that, but it's a combination of basically some activity and some, frankly, leaving it alone. Because, and also some, I would say, some exploration to kind of find out what else. Is it as, quote, easy as that? I mean, you know, you talk about how no self-respecting wedding in China can right. possibly uh, occur without shark fin soup, right. uh, because, and it's, it, which doesn't taste like anything and doesn't, and, and yet, you'd have to change vast amounts of culture, human yeah. culture, in order to achieve, I mean, oh. that's, is that, can you do that? I think it's doable, I think it's difficult. I mean, I don't, I think particularly, you know, everything that involves restrictions is, is hard. I mean, I think, you know, we're having, a, there's a really interesting debate that's going on right now in the Uni United States connected to what you're mentioning, which is that there's been this move to ban, for example, the sale, trade, and possession of shark fins, which is one of the main reasons why sharks are being targeted. They're, they're kind of dying for a couple of reasons, but in terms of targeting, that's why they're, they're being caught across the world. And now, so you have Hawaii, California, Oregon, Washington, all have outlawed it. You have initiatives in New York, Florida, Maryland, you know, and other states, uh, actually even the landlocked state of Illinois seeking to ban shark fins. 
And there's a whole debate. Are you, are you declaring war on someone's culture? Now, I would argue that, you know, we put huge restrictions on, on wild caviar when we realized that sturgeon, one of the most ancient fish, was disappearing. And people didn't say that's an attack on Russian culture. You know, they said, look, this species is in huge trouble and we're doing something about it. But I think, you know, it essentially, it, it, it's, a, it's a heavy lift. But if you convince people that essentially they have a reason to be invested in the ocean in the first place, it becomes a little easier. Well, I mean, talking about culture, it's not just the Chinese, right? I mean, there right. seems to be this connection between uh, testosterone and hunting these primal demon fish, right? right. I mean, so uh, what are you going to do, outlaw testosterone? No, and in fact, you know, when I was aboard, uh, there's, a, there's a fisherman called Mark the Shark who um, operates off Miami Beach who goes out with celebrities as well as just ordinary people, and it completely happened as a coincidence. When I was on the boat uh, with him one time, Rosie O'Donnell came up on her jet ski uh, and boarded, and later, and, uh, which is something I write about in the book, and later actually did go out fishing with him, and recently he posted these pictures, and they were a controversy. So um, it, it's, a, it's a kind of a macho-ness that is not necessarily uh, related to testosterone. And so, but, I, but I absolutely agree. I mean, I think that that's, that's tough. And then I think you also have the issue of just regular, also regular fishing, which, you know, again, we have... <coughs> You know, there are plenty of, of, of fishermen who think that it's their right to take as much as they can. And so this is tough. But I think that, you know, again, you can actually talk to people. And even ironically, there is something that is so, in some ways, macho about sharks to begin with, that there's a way that you could argue for their continued existence, even to the people who are most invested in kind of defining themselves by catching. I, I thought one of the most interesting things that you dealt with in, in, in Demon Fish was the role of human myth about, I mean, we're not talking about catching cod, right? right. I mean, we're right. catching, we're talking about great big teeth and I mean, just the, the stuff of our dreams, right? right. So um, you say the most effective way to save the shark is to explode our cultural myths about them, that they are manly to catch or they make good skin cream right. or they confer status on those who eat th their fins. Right. Again, I mean, what, what, what's the role of fetish or myth or fear or fascination? And, I mean, and what does that have to say to resilience? Yeah, I mean, it's a huge, it's a huge driver, and that's what's so interesting. That I find it interesting that this predicament for again this lethal predator that's out in the ocean is largely in our heads. I mean, that is really, you know, I, I find that really interesting. But I also think, in fact, that is what makes it doable. That particularly, I guess, and, and you know, I think part of what uh, you know, again, uh, 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 Professor Bao was mentioning is that this idea that we're apart from nature is something that I think is really one of the things one gets to, that it freaks people out to think that we are connected to sharks in some ways. But again, even evolutionarily, you can argue that the, you know, the muscles that we use to chew and to talk come from sharks. And so, I, and that again was something that I had no idea when I started reporting out this book. So I think when you think about that and you draw those connections and give a sense of how our own resilience in some ways stems from the fact that they are so resilient, I think that's where you can begin to kind of pierce through those myths. And so are you arguing that the first step in resilience is to is inside our own heads? Absolutely. I think I think so. And then it, and then it goes from there. But I think that basically if you don't get people to rethink the shark, then you're getting nowhere. That would be my theory. So we start with the sharks and then rethink everything else. Yeah, and then I think you can go from there. I mean, cuz if again, they're a fantastic place to to you know, start because there are few things that are as cool as sharks. Do we have any questions? Do we have anybody I can go on about this forever. I Anybody? No. Okay. No. Oh, well, there's actually. Something. You say I have somebody. Yeah. Got a mic. Wait, wait, wait. Wait, 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 wait for the mic and tell us who you are, please. Sorry, uh, George Mihais from Phoenix Partnership. How would you include everything you told us yeah. in a curriculum, in particular for high school children? Oh. Well, I mean, I, I, I could be incredibly self-interested and say just to sign my book, which would be <laughs> fine. Um, but I, I think, I mean, I actually think that essentially what you really want high schoolers to read about, and I think you can really do it at all ages. And in fact, you know, one thing I found interesting is it seems that fascination with sharks peaks among 11-year-old boys. So I'm a little worried that if you do high schoolers, you might have missed that key moment. But that said, uh, I, you know, I think essentially you can share with them just the, you know, the whole complex way in which we are interconnected sharks, and also the fact that we have such cutting edge sh science that's coming out right now about them. And that, to me, is really one of the most compelling cases for why this is so important right now, that essentially we are learning things with, for example, the same device that you use in the Nintendo Wii 
to track how sharks mate underwater, which is something that, again, has never been done and is being done by one academic at Moat Marine Lab in Sarasota. And so you really can find these ways. And, you know, frankly, one of the great things about sharks is because they're globally distributed, they really, you know, pe there are ways in which even high schoolers can see sharks, can interact with them, and things like that. This is not something that occurs in one isolated part of the world and therefore is, is really remote. And so that's what I would say. And you have a video about it? Um, I, I do. In fact, if people want to go to www.demonfishbook.com, there is a very short video on there, and there's also a way to contact me if you wanted to follow up. Do you have a video of the process of attaching a wee to a shark? You know, oh, I... Oh, you think this is easy. Oh, this is, this is the part that's worth reading. Exactly. <laughs> I, I do not, but Mo might have that, so we could always check with them. Oh, my God. I do. Uh, let's see. Who have we got? Uh, somebody who we haven't talked to. How about the guy in the blue shirt over there? My name is Mike Hager. Thank you for the very interesting presentation. I'm wondering, given what you say um, about sharks, uh, do you have a comment on how sharks are displayed in aquariums and whether they, there should be changes in the way we educate uh, our citizens through those aquariums? Right. Well, that, uh, that's actually a fascinating question. And I've both spent time in a number of aquariums, you know, research, meeting with people to research the book, but and also have appeared in a number of aquariums. So I've been able to see aquariums, you know, kind of across this country in the course of, of traveling for the book. You know, basically, uh, first of all, I think it's an area where you need a little more research. There are actually, uh, for, for two reasons. I mean, I think that there are plenty of places where there are easy ways to keep kind of lower level sharks like the leopard sharks, the nurse sharks, the, you know, epaulette. Those are, you know, those are ones that essentially are, you know, don't have the same needs as say a great white where the only place that's been kept in captivity successfully in the United States is the Monterey Bay Aquarium, which has done, which has been controversial, but I would argue has done a good job of keeping juvenile white sharks in captivity for a short period, tagging them and then releasing them into the wild. Uh, what, what is interesting and one thing I've pressed people on and there's just research starting now is I basically want to know whether by visiting aquariums are you more inclined to actually care about ocean conservation and while this is something that's kind of accepted as fact I think there actually needs to be more research on it and so I think and there literally there are a few people who are you know PhD candidates right now who are looking into that and so I think that's important but broadly speaking and so I mean I think it depends on the species I think seeing sharks physically is actually a very important thing. And so while I would certainly say if you have the opportunity, seeing them in the wild is the period where I think, you know, you kind of, uh, again, it was the first time I got in the water as sharks. So you throw the 11-year-old boys over the boat? Throw them, in the, throw them in the boat. I mean, I, so when, I was in, when I was cage diving with a great white, I was next to a nine-year-old Brazilian girl. So now I'm not necessarily saying that all nine, nine-year-olds might want to get in a cage with a great white, but it can be done. I can tell you ones that are, you know, better to get in the water with at that age. And I do think it's the moment that basically, again, it challenges your preconceived notion of sharks. And that's what happened to me. I was surrounded by sharks in Bimini in the Bahamas, um, praying that they wouldn't eat me. And I really began to look at them and look at how beautifully they were designed, really, and how they were moving through the water and how I was an afterthought. And that's really what got me to rethink. My right. Life. And you're, all the time you were thinking, I'm a reporter. It doesn't really... Uh, pay. It, it's not in your interest to eat me. Exactly. That was actually one of my calculations. <laughs> exactly. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Um, Deborah Shapley, blogger. Uh, Deborah Say, Shapley. Uh, yeah. Um, d did you find anything out about the impact of Jaws? Right. I mean, the the answer is it had a tremendous a tremendous impact, and one one has to say a, a negative impact on people's perceptions. I mean, I think Peter Benchley and I always, you know, my disclaimer is Peter Benchley became a huge person who actually did work on behalf of sharks. His widow Wendy Benchley does tremendous work to this day, and I think that you know he really did recognize that. What was interesting is he tapped into our deepest fears. It's not like people weren't freaked out before, but there was a way that he made it real and brought it home both through his book and his movie that, you know, that really, uh, you know, had a tremendous effect. And you can see, I mean, basically, there are statistical studies that uh, beach visits went down in the United States nationwide after it came out. I have interviewed multiple marine biologists who told me that they stopped going in the water as kids. But then, ultimately, one of the things is since a marine biologist, in many ways, is the hero um, of that, of, you know, of the book and the movie, that then they, um, particularly the movie more than the book, um, they came to see it as a great profession. So it's had a mixed thing. But there's no question that you saw shark fishing take off after that. Did this, I never thought of this. Did the, did the did Jaws increase the 
um, the visibility of marine biology? Did you see an in a huge increase in marine biologists immediately after you know, Bruce? You would have to, I mean, basically, I would, again, I would want the stats being a reporter, but there's, there's just no question that I have met, particularly, I have to say again, men who happen to be 11-year-old boys around that <laughs> band, you know, at the time that Jaws came out. There, a, there, are a number, there are a number of people who have made their careers in shark research who were inspired by, by Jaws. In the back there. Hi, uh, my name is Russell Mall. I was sitting here trying to figure out a tagline or a tweet to send to you. <laughs> mm -hmm. And the thing that kept uh, popping in my head is just a takeaway of this. Right. And I was wondering if it kept popping in my head like the Jeff Goldblum line from Jurassic Park, you know, life will find a way. And right. is, that, is that the resilient tagline learning takeaway piece that you'd like to leave with us? I, I think that's a good tagline. It's in fact, I have to give credit to the fact that actually there's a fantastic researcher at Stony Brook University, Damian Chapman, who, gave, who said that line to me when he was the person who discovered that they could do asexual reproduction. So, I mean, I think that that, uh, you know, that in fact life will find a way is, is, one of, is, is a pretty good uh, summary. And I, but I guess part of what it is is it's the quest of figuring out how it finds a way that I find particularly fascinating. Not just that there is survival, but how, how does survival work? Great. Let me uh, uh, take the, the last, let me do, do one last question. I mean, the one thing that makes me think in terms of resilience is that you say that, I mean, sharks have been around forever, evolutionarily, I mean, way before the dinosaurs and all that stuff. And that as a result, they're less resilient, they're less adaptable. What does that say for us? I mean, is, a, is, is it good that we're a new mongrel species? You know, that's interesting. I still think it's bad news because basically what it meant is because they've been such a top predator, they have not been pushed to change who they are. And I think, unfortunately, that phenomenon applies almost as well to humans, despite the fact that we're pikers in the evolutionary process. Great. Thank you very much, Julia. Appreciate Thank you. it. Thank you. Yep.